This program was made possible by generous grants from the Conference on Jewish Material Claims Against Germany, the Jewish Federation of Greater Kansas City, and the Jewish Heritage Foundation of Greater Kansas City, with special consideration from Outpost Worldwide. During the Holocaust, very few people, less than half of 1% of occupied Europe's total population, tried to rescue Jews and others targeted by the Germans. Some were motivated by kindness or by religious and moral principles. Others by opposition to German policy. And still others were paid for their help. Nevertheless, all of them acted at great risk to themselves and their families. But the Jews they helped did not simply sit back and let others take care of them. Rather, they involved themselves actively in the entire rescue process, setting it in motion as well as keeping it going. For example, in July 1942, when Anne Frank and her family went into hiding, they moved into the upper floors of a business property owned by her father. It was located behind another building, which he also owned, that housed the business's offices. Otto Frank began preparing and organizing the hiding place when he realized that he and his family would not be permitted to immigrate to the United States. These are the stories of four people who survived the Holocaust in hiding. Two, Ralph Barretts and Marguerite Klarenberg, are from the Netherlands. Two, Anne Walters and Maria de Vinci, are from Poland. Before the Holocaust, the Netherlands' approximately 140,000 Jews made up slightly less than 1% of the general population. Well integrated into Dutch political, economic, social, and cultural life, they lived in communities that could trace their roots back to the 16th century. In May 1940, the Germans invaded and occupied the country. In January 1941, anti-Jewish laws removed Jews from their professions, their schools, and their homes, and prohibited their access to public places. In April 1942, Jews of all ages were forced to wear identifying badges. Between 1942 and 1944, about 107,000 Dutch Jews were rounded up. Most were forced into the Fucht and Westerbork transit camps. From the transit camps, they were deported to concentration camps like Terezin and death camps like Auschwitz-Birkenau. Of those deported, only about 5,500 survived. Approximately 24,000 Dutch Jews went into hiding, and about 8,000 were caught. Altogether, three-fourths of Dutch Jewry, 75%, was murdered in the Holocaust, the highest proportion of any West European country. Several factors contributed to this. Escape was difficult because the country was bordered on the north and west by the sea, on the east by Germany, and on the south by German-occupied Belgium. The Jews were easy to find and collect because the country is small and they lived close to each other, concentrated in a few larger cities with more than half living in Amsterdam. Few natural or dry hiding places existed because of the country's flat terrain and high water table. The Germans were assisted by Dutch non-Jews because the government, the police, and certain political groups agreed with Nazi policies. Ralph Barretts Born in Amersfoort in 1939, Ralph was a toddler when he went into hiding with his parents and older sister. He spent his early childhood moving from one hiding place to another, having to remain absolutely still and silent, unable to play or go to school. When the Canadians liberated them in 1945, he was six years old. It was difficult to find hiding places, especially hiding places large enough to accommodate everyone. But the, uh, the Dutch uh, underground uh, was very helpful and uh, did provide us with a lot of leads and names and resources. Um, although you also have to recognize that I think my Parents were very lucky because they did have money, and I think uh, 
the assets really did help them to survive. Uh, my father, besides the diamonds and the gold also, uh, because of the fabric store, had a lot of silk. And that seemed to be a very prized possession. So whenever somebody went out of their way for us, he would pay them with either diamonds or gold or, or the silk. And uh, I'm not sure people, you know, just for that reason would risk their lives. But uh, I think my parents felt better being able to do something in return. Uh, we did belong to a synagogue in Holland that uh, gave us the information about uh, how we might try to escape from the oppression. oppression. Uh, the synagogue did give people the option of uh, going underground and uh, following their recommendations, and they were very helpful, although my father like, never just accepted one solution as a way out. And he himself had made a number of contacts, and the first uh, place where we stayed was really a, um, a Christian friend of his who had a cottage out in the middle of the woods. And uh, he asked him before the invasion if something should ever happen, whether or not he could use the cottage as a retreat. And uh, the man agreed very uh, wholeheartedly that certainly that was available to them. And as soon as the uh, Germans invaded, uh, we did go to his cottage and stayed there for about um, six or seven months until somebody gave away our secret and uh, we were caught. Uh, and it's at that time that uh, my father took advantage of the, uh, of the underground and um, took some of their leads to try to find an alternative place to hide. Well, this is the first incident that I remember. We were uh, in this cottage, which was um, in, uh, I'd say, um, a couple of hundred yards removed from a farmhouse. Um, and we had been living there in relative peace, and it was a, a very nice kind of retreat. Uh, and just the uh, four of us, my uh, mother, father, sister, and myself, were living there, and one evening, the uh, one of the farmer's children came and told us that they had heard that the Germans had been told of our existence and that they were looking for us and that we had better get out. And so we tried to put together some things, and uh, it was, I mean, one of the things I remember distinctly was how it was raining. I mean, unbelievable uh, sheets of rain, thunder, um, and we were very reluctant to leave the cottage because we didn't have any umbrellas or anything and, and didn't know where we were going. But anyway, he seemed quite agitated about the imminent possibility of us uh, being caught. And so uh, we put together a small little suitcase, and I think we got maybe 50 yards from the house when we heard these um, uh, cars and trucks pulling up and uh, heard screaming and yelling, and the German soldiers came to look for us. And um, we were like in a little ditch uh, below the um, uh, below the level where the house was, and I just I remember what I wore. I can remember you know the sounds that were going on, and they were screaming and yelling that here was all the evidence, and they knew that we were hiding there, and where were we? And they sort of went marching around, and, and I think the only reason we survived was because the weather was just so terrible that just didn't seem worth the effort to them uh, to keep looking. Uh, they marched around a couple of times and then uh, lit, uh, set the cottage on fire and uh, it uh, burned up. And they left, fortunately, without finding us, uh, saying something like, they'll come back and find us another time. And uh, the most distressing thing about that whole incident, although it was pretty distressing hearing the Germans and, and seeing the house uh, go up in flames, but. The next morning when uh, the sky had cleared and uh, we were uh, trying to clean up and, and find an alternative hiding place, we walked past the, uh, the barn and, uh, from the farmers and I guess one of the sons of the farmer, he had three sons, and one of the sons I guess had betrayed us and uh, his two brothers had uh, taken him and uh, stuck a hook up in his 
chin and hung him from the rafters in the barn and he, you could just see all the blood dripping down. And It was after we had to leave the, uh, the cottage that we were split up for a while and my sister and I stayed with one family for about three months. Uh, my mother stayed with uh, another family and my father uh, stayed on the top of a, uh, an, a garage. And it was very difficult uh, for us to really get to see one another. We were in the same city, but uh, it was very uh, precarious to travel. Um, my father felt like he couldn't go out at all. Uh, my mother did not, um, and so she was the one who usually went out to make the contacts and uh, find one food and uh, two resources to be able to um, uh, find another hiding place. Uh, and she used to take me on her bicycle. She thought that having a little child along would probably protect her to a greater extent than if she would travel by herself. And I just remember going on the back of the bicycle all the time and uh, not really knowing where we were going, uh, but uh, trying to find some way to uh, find shelter for the, uh, for the next day. Um, I remember my mother used to dye her hair or bleach her hair and, and also bleach mine. The next real incident I remember we had found this hiding place in the uh, on top of an ice cream store in uh, downtown Amersfoort. Uh, some, actually it was a wonderful place for us because uh, one of the things we got to eat was ice cream every day. Um, but the most horrendous thing, and, and here I think we only stayed there for about three weeks, and uh, one afternoon there were two German soldiers who came in to supposedly buy some ice cream. But they had also heard about the people who were living upstairs, and they wanted to look around. And fortunately, uh, the uh, woman who ran the ice cream store uh, managed to go up the back way and to warn us that the Germans were coming. They had built a little uh, trap door inside the closet so that you could go up this ladder in the closet and then lie down in the rafters above the second floor and that was sort of what we had planned as, as a, an escape route and so when she told us that the Germans were down there and we'd better go upstairs uh, and we did that and uh, we could hear the Germans talking and probing around and said, you know, well, where do these people go? And the woman said, well, I really don't know. They're, you know, they come here every once in a while, but they don't stay here permanently and they're not here now. Uh, that the Germans uh, wanted to inspect the upstairs because they heard some movement. Fortunately, I guess my sister was very attached to this little pussycat that the people downstairs had. And when we went up to crawl up in the attic, she took the pussycat with her. And uh, when the Germans said they were going to go upstairs to look, I guess my mother got so upset that she peed in her pants. And uh, water, I guess, came trickling down the ceiling. And the Germans said, well, we knew that there was somebody up there. And so they, when they went to look, they opened up the passageway and the pussycat came jumping out. And that seemed, uh, I don't understand why they didn't look anymore, except that there was very little space. You couldn't stand up or you could barely crawl through there. And uh, they seemed to be satisfied with the fact that the cat was up there and that uh, the cat had been responsible and therefore they stopped looking and so luckily we uh, managed to survive a second time. Um, but we also felt like it wasn't secure there any longer and so we had to find an alternative place again. Uh, the only, I, I know that we were hidden in several other places in between including an, an incident that uh, I don't remember at all, but uh, my parents talk about quite frequently. They talk about this couple that, uh, in fact, two couples, one couple that wanted to buy me where I had been hiding and one that wanted to buy my sister. And uh, I don't remember the, I, I, I don't have any sense of who those people were. Um, but uh, 
they ultimately decided that, for one, it wasn't fair to split the two of my sister and myself up, and one of the justifications was, well, each one wanted to take one, but neither one wanted to take two. Uh, and the other thing was that they had to sign an agreement uh, never to see us again if they agreed to this, and they just said they could not live with that, even though it might be safer for us. They didn't think that that was the right thing to do. So uh, we did try to keep the family together. And for the last three years or so of the war, we uh, stayed in a, uh, in a chicken coop outside of Arnhem. Um, it was, and there were uh, 12 people. Uh, I think eight of us were uh, close uh, family members, and then there were some uh, distant friends and uh, distant relatives as well. Uh, it was a rather small chicken coop, and there were basically uh, two places to sleep, uh, and we just sort of slept in shifts, and uh, it was very stark. There were just some wooden planks, and uh, I can remember uh, just a terrible smell, although the chickens weren't in there anymore, but the odor was certainly there. And the other thing that I remember was there was a huge bunker uh, about Oh, I'd say a couple of hundred yards from the chicken coop. And every time that we would hear planes flying overhead, we were told to run to this bunker as a kind of shelter. And uh, even though we felt fairly isolated in the chicken coop, when we were in the bunker, there must have been, I may have a distorted memory, but it seems to me 50, 60 people that used to be in the bunker, and it always felt like... Uh, sardines. I mean, to be stuck in the bunker was like, I mean, you couldn't do anything but stand where you were because every, everything was so crowded that uh, you couldn't sit down or bend over or do anything. And I can remember a couple of incidents in the, uh, in the chicken coop. One night uh, we were being attacked, a lot of shooting going on in the area, and uh, there was one little window that we had, and something came through the window. Um, looked like a large acorn, um, and uh, dropped on the floor. And we sort of woke up. We had no light; couldn't really tell what it was. And nothing happened afterwards. When we woke up the next morning, we discovered it in the middle of the floor, and it turned out to be a hand grenade. Uh, it just <coughs> didn't go off. Um, it just, I mean, if you recount all the incidents, it seems like, you know, I don't know if it's destiny or fate or just pure luck, uh, but we managed every time when we had, there was this kind of danger, uh, we managed to escape. Um, the thing that allowed us to survive in the chicken coop, I remember the, uh, the farmers uh, basically said, you know, we can't give you any food, but anything you find you're entitled to. And the, uh, the thing that we used to eat all, uh, all year round uh, was potato peels, uh, the outer leaves of the cabbage, and, uh, and I remember the great celebrations we used to have for birthdays when we used to get an egg. That was the, uh, the big thrill. Um, but basically all we ate were uh, potato peels, uh, pote peels from apples, and uh, the outer shell of um, of white cabbage, and I guess the white cabbage was the main form of sustenance. And about three months before the uh, ceasefire was signed, uh, there were some Germans that were stationed uh, a couple of miles from uh, where we were hiding out, and they knew about us, and we knew about them, um, and they didn't really do anything. Um, the one night they. Uh, came over to the, uh, to the chicken coop and asked my parents if they would play bridge with them. <laughs> and the funny thing is that I, I remember throughout most of the war, my parents always told us, you know, you got to be quiet. You can't make any noise. You know, you have to behave yourself and control yourself. And when uh, this particular incident occurred, they said to my sister and, and, and to me, uh, you know, please make as much noise as you can, cry if at all possible. We don't want to play cards with these Germans. We would like to get rid of them, but we can't do it. And, you know, maybe if you make it uncomfortable, they'll leave. 
And of course, we had <laughs> not been used to making noise or crying, and I guess d even though my mother told us to do that, uh, I remember not being able to. And uh, it was a, a most uncomfortable evening because my parents, pretty good bridge players, were afraid if they would win, they might uh, uh, be executed, and if they would lose, they might be accused of cheating. And so they just, they really didn't know how to respond. Um, but fortunately, the, uh, the Germans stayed for about uh, three hours and, um, and left. Marguerite Klarenberg. Soon after she was born in 1928, Marguerite and her parents moved from Germany to the Netherlands. She was 15 years old and living in Utrecht when the family went into hiding. For the first year, she hid apart from her parents. Later, she played a key role in their efforts to find food, fuel, and new hiding places. When a unit of Polish soldiers liberated them in 1945, she was 17 years old. We got a notice, uh, my mother that she had to go to Poland, to work camp. They called it work camps. And there were big discussions in my family because she said, if they say that I have to go to work, there's nothing against working. That's the law. Let's do it. Now, I was a teenager, and I said, I'm not going. Because I, again, was under the age and had to go with my mother. And the family says, what do you mean you're not going? Are you scared of work? No. I don't, I don't want... And what I... I remember that I said, I don't want the fence around me, but I really meant what I didn't realize then is somebody who's telling me what to do. The, uh, and it saved our life, really. Um, what happened then is a friend of the family, he was a physician, he was a surgeon, and he told me how to handle to have an appendicitis. <laughs> and I went to another surgeon, and he told me exactly what to say. And I got admitted at the hospital. They cut me open and saw that I was healthy, took the appendix out, and then they put me on a bed high up. I was for three weeks in the hospital. The, this surgeon who did this was very angry. Uh, and he said to my mother, do you know they could have cl they can close my hospital for that if they find this out? But meanwhile, it was past the date that she had to go to Poland. We got a second. Uh, letter to go to Poland in April, March or April. When we got the second letter to go, and I told my parents again that I didn't want to go, my parents said, okay, try to find a place to hide. If you can find something, and we don't know how to do it. And there was a problem also. Don't forget financially, there was no income anymore for years already. and. Literally, you have your money in a shoebox under the bed. And when the money is gone, what are you going to do? And that's scary. For me, it was not because, oh, you're young and you think it will. But for my parents, yes, there was a responsibility involved. And I remember that my parents, my mother probably, uh, my father was not that passive, but in handling things, my mother was the one, um, said, why don't we find something for you in hiding that's much easier? And we go, and then you at least have enough money. And, and I somewhere tried to talk them into it, and they said, okay, if you find a place where we can hide. And I, were, but I, I remember I walked because you couldn't bike anymore. As a Jew, you didn't have a bike. There was no transportation that we could use. So I walked, and people told me, go, and these people probably will help, but these people, and for several days, and I couldn't find anything. My mother had an uncle and aunt who lived in The Hague also, in a boarding house. The owner of the boarding house was a Mrs. Gamble. Mrs. Gamble was married to Mr. Gamble, who was English, and her husband was in a concentration camp. The Germans had p picked up. Uh, uh, she had also a son. And uh, the son was also in uh, the camp for English people, and Mrs. Gamble helped us. Mrs. Gamble came and she said, I will help you f to hide. And we went to her house, and she said, don't bring anything. Or they picked up probably a suitcase, but we, we, all the time in the war, you leave everything behind. I mean, what you wear, it's about it. And 
a few things. I had a small suitcase somewhere, and that I got lost somewhere too, but anyway. And so we came, and she, we couldn't come together at, at the same time. It was all organized, and we there. And I remember that she took her scissors, and she cut off the Jewish uh, star from my father's. Good, my father, what are you doing? And she said, it's okay. You, for the time being, you can stay here. She had not told us this before. But I have to, I can't keep you all three. But um, I will find a place for for Margarita or, uh, or whatever. I don't remember how, how to come. But so that's the, the beginning of our hiding. Ines found a home for me, but the people had a boarding house and they needed, you couldn't find her help in uh, for housework. So they wanted somebody. And I was meanwhile 15, 16 probably, getting on 16, somewhere in that neighborhood. And I uh, could do the housework. But the main thing was they wanted me to do the kitchen work because in her, the boarding house, I forgot how many boarders they had, but the people ate that too. So. In that time, you, the Dutch eat potatoes a lot, like I told you, and they're peeled, so we got pails of potatoes. I can peel potatoes very fast. <laughs> <laughs> and um, fish, you could get fish still. The, so, but anyway, um, the people, I had some bad experiences there. I was there only for probably half a year. I didn't want to complain. And I slept in the kitchen, there was a little, Oh, room of the kitchen, and I put a bunk bed there, and I, that's where I slept. And I really started at six in the morning and then worked till quite late. Uh, the story is uh, kind of a sad story. I told you about an uncle and an aunt I had when we came through. They went also into hiding. We lost somewhere at, towards the end. We didn't know because we didn't live in the same town anymore. And, and I, they did, the, the people were in the house I lived didn't want me to meet people, the boarders in the house. So I, and I had a daughter, and the daughter of a brought, brought the food up to the people on trays. One day, I, a tray came back with a tea caddy. The Dutch have special tea caddies. And I had embroidered that for my aunt. And I recognized that tea caddy. Of course I recognized it. And accidentally, uh, because they didn't know I was there, I mean, I didn't come out of my kitchen. And I knew that they had to be there. And I remember I went up, they had a room in, in the attic, it was a big house, uh, four level, three, four levels, I've got one. Four levels, but uh, they were on the third level. And I did hide to see if somebody would come out of the room because the, the restroom was across the hall. And I don't remember, I did it once or more. Uh, my uncle came out of there, and it was my uncle. And we started crying and went into the room and, and we kissed each other and cried. And the lady of the house heard, heard it, on, I don't know how she knew about it. And she came upstairs and she hit my aunt. She thought that they had done it. And I never forget this, my aunt was, an, she was really, an, a, a real lady, like elegant lady, and, and I, I remember that this this was it went through me. Now when I'm talk about it, I still get goosebumps uh, because it was so degrading again. So uh, it's a sad story to finish this. Uh, I got the flu. And I felt miserable. And the, uh, this lady who has helped us uh, came every so often, once a month or so, I don't remember the time, to see how everything was okay and brought my coupons because the underground gave coupons also to these people for my eat, for my food. And found me sick. I was miserable. I had the flu and I felt so sick. And she said to me, can you sit on the back of my bike? You know, all, everybody in Holland bike rides. And she said, why? I said, why? And she said, oh, I want to take you home for the time being, until you're better. 
So I went with her uh, to her house. That was the 1st of April, 1944. The 3rd of April, the Germans came and picked up my uncle and aunt. So I, I never went back. And I told you I lost my clothes somewhere on the road. That was where I lost, because that was it. And then they found for me in other place. So there is a special school along one of the rivers. The head of the school lives in a house right next, or lived in a house right next to the school. And he had a wife who was sickly, had three sons, and adopted a little girl, four-year-old girl. I needed some help in the household. And I, I went to these people, lovely people. Um, stayed there for, I don't remember, I would say a year, eight months, a year. I had some problems there. So the, the big building was empty, the school building. And the German uh, Air Force Luftwaffe went into this building. And oh, I, I, I saw them, of course, all the time. It was the same ground. And OK, I speak German, of course. And, and uh, somewhere I talked to them, uh, kind of doing normal, because officially I was not Jewish. And, and if I would have run away from them, it would not have been normal. And uh, one day, the, the man where I was in hiding, came to me and he had an, a leather bag. And he said, do you know the bag? And my heart stopped beating because this was my father's attaché case. I told him, yes, it's my father's. And then he said to me, okay, there's a man here. Uh, and he says that he knows where your parents are. And he wants to, br to bring you because your mother's birthday is next week as a surprise she doesn't know it we would like to bring you your father told us this now officially my parents didn't know where i was they they were not in the house of, of this english dutch woman anymore and they found an other, other place outside of this town uh, in a house of a man who worked in a factory he had a little piece of land there and he was a factory worker, wife and two small children. And my parents were, could stay there. Um, I was first a little bit scared, but still he knew the birthday of my mother and, and the people in the house said there was no problem and, and uh, I should go. And he indeed brought me to my parents who were in his house. He was the man who did hide my parents. And of course, we hadn't seen each other for a year, year and a half, and it was very emotional. And I told him everything. And I told him also, my parents, about the, the German Luftwaffe, Luftwaffe the, who was there, the Air Force. I left again and went back. About three, four weeks later, the man came again and asked how he could, I could get an, or the weekend to my parents. And the people said, sure. I went with him to my parents, and my mother said, or my father, uh, you stay here, you don't go back. Because we have talked to the underground, it's much too dangerous to be there with, with all the Germans. And you can stay here. The people here will take you, and the underground will take care of, of uh, coupons. He built for us, there's a marsh, it was, all this is marshland, but he lived on a dike. And he built for us a, a little road to in the middle of the marsh where trees were. And he built a little hut. But the hut was really only a bed with straw. We had uh, mice there, not rats. I remember mice were looking at you. And, and, and <laughs> uh, I'm never scared of mice anymore or rats. And we slept in that um, because it was more secure than stay in the house. My father fell and broke his leg. And the custom over there was that every Tuesday and Friday, the doctor 
drove the dog that silly car, drove over the dike because the, the, they lived on the dike. And if you wanted the doctor, you put a, wet, a, wet, a white piece of cotton on your doorpost or in the gate, and then the doctor st stopped and came. <laughs> so that, that's what I did with my father to to set his uh, leg. And uh, I'm sure that lots of neighbors knew about this because people live so close together that. Uh, but everybody was so against the Germans that. Uh, this went okay till the day before Christmas. There was really no food anymore. Now the uh, the Germans uh, had taken away basically all the food, and I remember that the woman said to us, and that was like I say, the day before Christmas. Uh, people, I'm very sorry, but I have two children and we we don't have much food anymore. I would like you to find something else. Of course you can stay till after Christmas, but that's the way it is. This is already what we call the hunger winter. I knew a woman who said to me that she knew somebody in the town of Utrecht. You remember that town? That's only 10, 12 miles away. She knew somebody who was a black market marketeer, and he had a little shed in the marsh. And she said she would go with me to, to see how we could get that shed from, to live for us, because there was no underground anymore. I mean, we were lost. And we understood that what the woman said where we were in the house. I mean, she, her children came first. There was no question about it. I went with this woman to, th to these people and I said it was like I'm, it's not for me, it was for a Jewish family for one week, what was, would be okay, and the man gave us a key. The um, hut was, I would say about six by eight yard, uh, feet, excuse me, not yard, dirt floor. Now it was in the middle of the winter, and there was a little, in front, a little part of it that had, had built on that looked like a tent, but it was made of plywood. And there was one of these little ovens that he sold, actually. He made the money with this. You can put in anything you want, it burns, and then it heats. Now, we didn't have anything. We had uh, a bag with 25 pounds of... Uh, uh, be, uh, beans, and we, hang, we did hang this on the wall, and we got from the woman who went with me an uh, iron pot, and they had used this for pig food. So I remember my father cleaned it, because there was water, but it was all ice. On the 1st of January, we went into the uh, little hut. We didn't, there was no toilet. So we made out of a box, it was not even uh, wood. He cut uh, something up and there was a pail. And we put the pail on these and we used it behind. And we had we had a bathroom that way. My mother and I went to steal wood. Now we couldn't burn or, or, or cook in daytime because then they would see from the dike that there was uh, somebody living. So we only cooked at night. There was no bed, but we had a mattress. Uh, and the mattress was, was standing at the wall and was wet. And there was a sofa and one chair, I think. And what we did is we took the mattress and we, we slept so that you, you, your legs came off, out under the mattress, but so all three of us could sleep because the sofa was so wet that the, had to dry up. There was snow outside. We, when we came, it, there was ice actually. And in daytime, it, we didn't have any heat because we couldn't turn this little oven on. And, and we also stole. Um, ah, how do you call it? it it's a an, an vegetable. It's a relative of a cabbage. It's around. Brussels sprouts? Is it Brussels sprouts? Yeah. Uh, there were Brussels sprouts, and I remember they were all frozen. And there are lots of them on, on a stick. 
and I remember us stealing them. And uh, the the big, uh, uh, how you call it, turnips. Uh, what you do is you uh, you let let them boil, and it comes with sweet syrupy. Uh, after I don't know many hours, so we had that, and then we had 25 beans a person a day. And that was our food. Before the Holocaust, more than 3 million Jews lived in Poland. It was the largest Jewish community in the world. It was a dynamic and diverse community whose roots went back to the Middle Ages. Polish Jews had citizenship and civil rights, and most Jewish children attended public school. Many lived in small towns and villages, but most lived in cities. Everywhere, Jews were well integrated into Poland's economic life. However, anti-Semitic restrictions and attitudes limited their opportunities and kept Jews from being fully accepted into Polish society and culture. Soon after they invaded Poland in 1939, the Germans directed numerous harsh measures against Polish Jews. They also forced them into ghettos, where thousands died because of the brutal conditions. In 1942, the Germans began deporting Jews from the ghettos to the six death camps established on Polish soil. Some non-Jews tried to help the Jews, but most did not. Many were anti-Semitic or indifferent to the Jews or feared incurring the hostility of their neighbors. Many were discouraged by the thoroughness and focus with which the Germans searched for hidden Jews and their rescuers or were frightened by the death sentences the Germans imposed not only on the rescuers they caught, but also on their families. Out of a pre-war community of more than 3 million, representing almost 10% of Poland's total population, only about 300,000 Polish Jews survived the Holocaust. Anne Walters. Born in 1932 in Rajiwów, Anne was nine years old when she and her parents and four siblings went into hiding. They changed their hiding places at least 52 times. When the Soviets liberated them in 1945, she was 13 years old. Anne and her family were the only survivors of what had once been a Jewish community of 670 people. We walked through the field to a, um, to a uh, village. Uh, the name of it um, was uh, Konopk. We went there. Uh, my, f my father took me along. Uh, he wanted to go into the village uh, without the whole family. And uh, my family remained in, in the field, and I remember we got, we got to this one house. He, he was, this man was um, the head of the village, and uh, he was sick at the time, had some problems with the leg. Um, I think his name was Bolek. And um, uh, I couldn't follow everything, the conversation, but uh, uh, my father really asked him, if he could help us. Um, there were some other, other people. And the first comment that, that uh, there was from those people was, um, as Jews, we cannot help you. Um, if you promise to, to convert, then we will try and help you. Um, of course, my father agreed. Um, we um, then we went back, and uh, um, my 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 family saw that that I well, my father left me with the farmer, and that was a sign for my family to to know that uh, my father was offered some help. So uh, the rest of the family came. Um, this particular farmer, even though he was powerful and he was influential, he still was afraid and he wasn't sure. Uh, so they took us into the field um, among some uh, 
bushes. Uh, we stayed in the field for about uh, a couple nights, two, three days, and then um, we were taken back to the to uh, to um, to the village, and uh, we uh, we were divided um, among different um, farmers, and uh, each one of us stayed with another family. We were with the farmers a, f a few months. Um, we were a few months until the Germans started to um, liquidate the ghettos in Poland. Um, then came an order uh, from the Germans um, that we, we needed to report, or rather they did not even communicate with us, they communicated with the, with the villagers that they should bring us to town and as a matter of fact to Bialystok because in our town there were no, no Jews survived really, there were no Jews. Um, so they were to bring, bring us to, um, to Bialystok, to the ghetto in Bialystok. And uh, we, we ran away, we just, uh, the Poles, thankfully they did not run after us to capture us and they, they allowed us to, to run away. And from uh, then on, we went in complete hiding. Um, hiding meant um, we, we barely saw the, the light of the day. Uh, we were in bunkers, uh, we were in, in barns, um, uh, we were in cellars, um, in attics. Um, we uh, we were extremely fortunate that that um, uh, the poles, as dangerous as it, as it was for them too, they were willing to help us. Um, I must say many of them didn't do didn't help us because of humanitarian uh, reasons alone. Um, nevertheless, of course, thanks to all of them. Uh, we survived. Without their help, we had no chance. Um, our flour mill was intact, uh, which meant that um, that um, there was some financial uh, source, if not immediate, for the future. Um, there was there was um, my m my parents who had lived through the first world war. They had some experiences. So, as far as what kind of shortages there are during the war, etc. So the money that they had, they invested in fabrics, um, and they took it out to a uh, one farmer that they knew. Um, and uh, and when we were hiding, my father would go and get a piece of fabric, and give it to the family so they could, you know, have some help because the Poles, uh, it was extremely difficult for them too. We, we changed many, many hiding places. Um, some places we were able to, to stay a little longer, uh, some places we could stay only a week or two, uh, in some places only two of us could stay uh, at a time, um, sometimes all of us. Um, how, how did you know when you needed to move on? Well, um, we tried to keep it a secret when we got to a, to a particular uh, ha home or, or, or farmer. And they, either they were scared, the family was scared, and if they were scared, we, we had to leave because um, all they needed to do really is to go out and, uh, and tell a German that he, here are Jews. And uh, and they would they wouldn't suffer, they would get us of course, but they wouldn't suffer. Uh, otherwise, um, you know, they would have been shot and killed just like we would have been if if they were found that they are helping a Jew. My my parents, especially my mother, when we were laying and hiding um, in the darkness, uh, especially when the situation was very very tense, and those were times when um, the Germans would find somewhere a Jew hiding. Um, the Poles really 
it, it, it was very, very tense, and they were very, very afraid. And uh, there were times that um, I, I remember one time the farmer dug a, a it wasn't even a bunker; it was a like a hole in I don't know how uh, how to call it um, in in the um, uh, barn where, where they keep the straw and hay for the winter for the livestock. Uh, there is a paved um, a part of it in the center where where they uh, work. Um, they used to. It, it was quite primitive. They used to put the wheat on the on the ground and sort of beat it with a with some sort of a lash of some kind to separate the grain from the straw. So under that, the the, uh, the farmer dug a hole, a uh, big enough for us to crawl under, just on our bellies really, and um, until things quieted down. My mother would would um, talk to me. Uh, all the talk was was in a whisper because we could not take the chance of of being heard. Um, she would talk to me. She would, being that I was the youngest and I didn't have much education yet, um, she she would tell me about the Jewish uh, history and the heritage, and uh, she wanted to be sure that I know who I am, and. Uh, and who my people are, and she tried to instill in me the pride of being Jewish, and not to think that because we are exterminated and uh, and treated the way we are, that we really deserve that. And they and she would tell me um, stories from the history about some heroic, um, especially heroic events that took place. Um, she would tell me that if in case I'm the only one who would survive, to be sure to somehow get to a to a center where there are Jews, and uh, and to to go to Palestine, and and go on with my life. We'd really like to know a little bit more about your day-to-day -day life in hiding. The food um, we we would receive from the people who who were hiding us. Um, it was irregular, and many times it was very difficult for them to uh, to prepare the food or bring it over, uh, because um, the farmers lived, you know, close by, and they would visit one another. And of course, they knew if they cooked another pot of soup, let's say, they knew that something unusual was happening. And they also to bring it over, if it were across the street. Uh, that was a problem too. So many times, um, only under the cover of darkness, uh, they would bring over a pot of soup and, and spoons. Um, they would bring over a, a loaf of bread. Um, there were times that we really we did not have any food. Um, there was a, a, a time, uh, like six months before we were liberated, where the Russian army was close enough where we were hiding, um, and they stopped. So the local population uh, was evicted. You know, they, were, they had to go back. And uh, we, we had to stay in the bunker that we had at the time, which was uh, really a bunker that the entrance was through, through a, a, a barn or a pig's, uh, um, well, the pig's stay, I don't know what it's called. Right, and um, so we were we we were staying there, and the farmer I remember twice uh, he endangered his life, and he brought us a loaf of bread each time. And uh, other than that, it was uh, in the fall, and my younger brother would go out at night and uh, get her some vegetables in the field because the farmers were not there to get her. Their, their crops. And it was a dangerous situation because it was so close to, to the actual war. And the, the, the German soldiers were marching back and forth along you know, the, the, the street. And he would have to wait until he would pass one way and then he would go out and gather some vegetables, carrots, um, um, 
r rhubarb or something like that. And the bread that on two occasions we got, we kept almost like a, a, a medication, like a, a survival uh, source. Um, a, we would take a small piece and put it in our mouth when we would feel faint, really. Um, a, there was one time I remember, it was my father, my sister and I, we changed, we had to leave the hiding place wherever we were and go to another one. Um, which by the way, my mother may, uh, did a counting on, on how many times we had to change hiding places. Uh, she came up with a uh, number of 52, uh, which we revisited some of the hiding places. But there were a lot of people involved. We, we, uh, uh, we never told the people where we came from or where we're going to. Um, a little bit for, our, for their security and, and they should think, well, maybe my neighbor helped them, so why shouldn't I? And, uh, and also it was more secure for us. Uh, when we were at this bunker that I mentioned before, um, the rain started coming down. It was fall. And uh, the bunker was on the outside. It was covered, but it was on the outside. It was not under a roof. And the, the water started dripping through the mud um, on us. And, uh, um, and we were actually sitting in mud. And we just saw we, we had no choice. We had to get out of there. And when we got out of there, um, most of us couldn't even walk. My mother fainted. Uh, and um, it was the middle of the night. Usually we changed our hiding places uh, in the middle of the night. Um, even the moon, if the moon was out, it was too light. It had to be real dark. And if the weather was bad, in a way, we felt safer that nobody was there uh, to, to run into us. Um, and um, as far as clothing, um, we had a coat from home yet. Um, the, the farmers would give us a, a, a coat or so, uh, or a blanket. My younger brother one time was was very sick. He, he caught a cold and he's, he probably had pneumonia maybe, I don't know. It was hurting in his chest and, uh, and somehow uh, my father, while he was laying in the bunker, many of the bunkers, by the way, weren't tall enough to, to even sit. Uh, I, as the smallest, and I always was sort of short for my age, uh, in some of the bunkers I was able to sit. Not all of them, but some of them I was able. But anyway, my, my father held my brother in close to him and he sort of kept him warm and and he got over it um, my older brother um, was bitten by some sort of an insect or I don't know what it was but it um, he he um, he had a, a blood infection from it and there was this red line coming and we, we didn't have any first aid whatsoever. Not a Band-Aid, I mean, even if they had Band-Aids in those days, the way we know them now. Um, and it was, it was critical, it was critical. There was no way that he could go to a doctor. And a, my sister went, went to another part of, of, it was in the hay, like in, on a barn on the top. And she went to another part where we were, and she was crying because it was obvious that he, he wasn't going to make it. And she found a piece of, um, of lard, a, a, not, not the melted type, but the, the actual um, slab of, of the lard. A, a small piece from a time where the people that, that kept us, brought us with a, with a loaf of bread or whatever, and a, and a kit. You know, we, we, we ate only as much as we had to, and then we would save it for later or for next morning, because we didn't know what we'll have next morning. 
and a kid found it and it, it stole it from us. So, you know, we didn't have it at the time and we, we just felt we, it's gone. And, and he kept it against his wound and uh, somehow he survived. Maria da Vinci. Born in 1920, Maria grew up in Vojiswav. She was 23 years old and a slave laborer when she went into hiding with her husband, her mother, and her two brothers. A Polish officer, the brother of one of her high school classmates, arranged her departure from the labor camp and protected them throughout the experience. When the Soviets liberated them in 1945, she was 25 years old. 1943, January. We went into a farm and digged. And that time, I was married. It was me, my husband, my two brothers, my mother. We didn't went all together, but little by little, that gentile brought us together to that bunker. We digged a square of 10 feet wide, six feet deep, and we all was hiding in that. The beginning was me and my two brothers, then my husband, then my mother, then my husband's sister, two children. We was in that place several months. My husband had a lot of money because everything they took out from the store, they had a lot of merchandise stored between friends. They had textile business, the wholesale. And those, those people where he storaged everything, give him as much as he need. Every month he went there for that. We was paying to that farmer 10,000 slotters, uh, here's dollars, but whatever the amount is, a month to keep us. One good day, it was very crowded. We was almost like not sitting, but standing up when we were sleeping, because was in the, in the was no air underground. We had to open the cover was a piece of board put together in a square, and straw on top, hay, straw, whatever a farmer has in his uh, in his garages. And we had to lift it up from underneath to lift up that little things a little bit to get some air. Otherwise, the little light what we have, we had a petroleum little light downstairs, went out by not having have, have enough, enough air to survive. And we seven people survived. We had to sleep there, we had to eat there. If the woman was in a good mood, she brought us down potatoes. She boiled potatoes with the skin for the kettles, for the pigs, for the poultry, whatever. So she throw down a few potatoes for us. If she was in a good mood, if she not, was not, we could wait two and three days for some food. Everything happened in the middle of the night, like two, three o'clock in the morning. We were sure there's nobody in, on the farms or on the area. We went up and got a little water from, it was like, like water we have to go through with a, uh, what would you call this? It comes out from a spring. A well? A well. We have to, and, and, a, and a, a bucket went down, you rolled it down and brought up a little water and we shared. The water was the only solution we had ever night. We went up, had some water that was solve our hunger and hard days. And of course, this was going on for months and months. I got very sick, my mother got very sick. We didn't think we were surviving. We didn't care anymore. It was so uncomfortable, and it was so embarrassing. Everything was just the, no, the clean cleanser and the, the, the mice and everything else was living with us. We slept with them, we ate with them. It was just not even, in one word saying, I really don't know what makes us, how strong a person is, what makes us think it's worth to fight this and to continue and try to survive. Because every day, the Gestapo come in on a farm for food. 
they need cattle, they need whatever, whatever for the army that's stationed all over in the area. They come in for food. And when they used to come in, the first thing they ask, any Judah here, any Judah, or any Jews around on the farm, they was going around and on those areas where they have any kind of suspicious, put the, the, the things from the, from the rifle down to point, point up or it's, it's the ground that's soft. If it's soft, they open it. They try to see what's underneath. And a lot of people was killed this way. They brought them up from the grounds. There was a lot of people hide on fires in that particular area. I don't know any other places. So there was not a day where they didn't show up. And that was our days waiting for. Uh, we will survive tonight, they will be left next day, or whatever the case would be. One good day, the farmer come in, and come in, this was a Sunday. He come in and he sat and knocks on our things. We didn't open, but he said, I'm Vladek. We opened a little bit of things. He says, I have to talk to you. What is it? I just got back from church, and they, they was telling me in church, there's rumors on the farm This I'm keeping Jews. They start living a little more richer than before because money was coming in every month to an extent he was going around bragging about this. He's going to build a new house, going to turn down what he has. And his wife was going to the city and buying better clothes. There was kind of rumor, suspicious. So we know after that discussion, we have no chance to stay. So we all packed, dressed, and as women, the men and the women, dressed as women and put in some kind of a little cover up in a basket mid eggs. Everyone was having a basket mid eggs. We had to walk seven miles to 11 o'clock in the night. We did this. We walked through a, a, a post was where some soldiers was stationed in that place. And one, the post was staying in front of it. Of course, you have to watch it like a watchman. He asked us, stop in Germany. Wo gehst du? And we all were speaking with German. He said, we're going from the market. What do you have? Eggs. He said, go ahead. Eggs he didn't need. If he would probably say, kielbasa or sausage or something, yes, or vodka, he probably would stop us. We said, eggs. So he let us go. He said, go. He didn't know we, whatever we are. We went to that other farm and settled there. We didn't have too much money left. Most of the money went to that farmer. But the other farmer, and all, all those things was done by a gentile. He was an army man. He was in the Polish army on the underground. And he did this because I went to, the, the friendship was that was doing business in our, in our place, in our store we have in that city. But uh, I went to school with his brother, went to gymnasium. We was close friends. And he felt sorry for me. He wanted to help me. So he, he was the one to put that whole things together with that farmer and tell him, I'm overlooking them and don't do any harm to him because you be in the same situation they are because I'm going to be in their side. So he kept us as long as he wanted. The other farmer, he went to the other farmer. He told them, they don't have any more money. They're not going to be able to pay you. But I will reward you to have homes. We had beautiful homes. My husband's site was very wealthy. And we had a beautiful home. Whatever, the wall is not going to be forever. And that was already in 44. I, if they're not alive, I will reward you. And that, that the old man trusted him. He says, okay, I take him in. And they built the same things underground, and we stay there till the end of the war. In the meantime, 
was still a shortage. Even he needed some money. My older brother went out to the city in the middle of the night, Saturday night, in 44, April 50, to get his clothes. He had a couple of suits, some jackets, some other stuff. Try to bring it to that farmer, tell him, go sell it. Whatever you get for it, $10, $20, something will help you for whatever. And when he went to pick this up, the man said, I buy the suit from you. How much you want? He said, whatever you give me. I give you $30. Okay. He said, $30 better than nothing. He took the $30, walked back, tried to come back to the farm, was seven miles from the city. He followed him. He killed him and took away the, the $30 from him. Ralph, Margalit, Anne, and Maria represent a few of the several thousand Jewish men, women, and children out of the millions murdered who survived the Holocaust because some of their non-Jewish countrymen dared to help them. How many more would have survived had more people tried to do the same?